Today's webinar is Accessibility Considerations in Open Education, and this is in partnership with our friends at NW Heat. Kim will drop a link in there so you can learn more about it. And my name is Megan Raymond. I lead membership programs and sponsorship here at WCET, and I have the privilege of working with amazing people like our upcoming moderator. And I really enjoy doing these webcasts because we get to share some of the cool work that's going on. You can ask your questions directly. And uh, as we go through, you make sure to contribute to the chat, any resources or ideas that you have, but do add your questions to the Q&A. Often, if they are put into chat, we lose track of them and we don't want to lose your valuable questions. The slides can be accessed via the link that Kim will share in the chat. And then if you want to follow along on what is formerly known as Twitter and is X, you can follow the hashtag WCET webcast. Again, slides, the link to the recording, and any shared resources will be sent via email. Now, I'd like to go ahead and welcome today's moderator, Judith Sebesta. She's the founder and principal with Sebesta Education Consulting. Welcome, Judith. Thank you so much, Megan. And I would like to thank WCET for inviting me to moderate this session with these amazing panelists that we have today and this very, very important topic. I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves at this point. Good morning. Um, I am just grabbing my, uh, adjusting to my different screens here. Um, my name is Heather Blicker, she, her pronouns. I'm the program director for the Community College Consortium for OER with Open Education Global. My priority is to advance the field of open education at community and technical colleges across North America by building community among members um, and providing support to practitioners in developing and, and leading the next phase of open education innovation. I'm pretty new to this role. Um, and so my most recent positions were with Open Oregon Educational Resources as an instructional designer and an equity consultant. Um, and during that time, I focused on equity. I worked with instructors to guide them in considering accessibility from the start of their work. Uh, for those of you familiar with Universal Design for Learning or UDL, the idea is to be proactive in designing materials to accommodate the widest possible range of learners from the outset, rather than going back and retrofitting based on the needs of the learners. So I'm really happy to be here to share my perspective and, and thank you for the invite. Thank you so much, Heather, and congratulations on your new position with CCC OER. Karen? Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Cangelosi. I'm also really excited to be here. I am currently the director of the Every Learner Everywhere Network, um, which is one of the organizations under the WCET. And uh, so my street care in open education kind of comes from uh, a number of different roles, uh, starting with having been a faculty member in biology at Keene State for almost 29 years <laughs> and uh, having incorporated OER in my courses. I spearheaded a movement to replace traditional textbooks with OER, ran a faculty uh, learning community in open pedagogy and uh, did a lot of work with open education in our teaching and learning center at Keene State. Then I went on to work for Open Education Global um, underneath the CCC OER. I ran the uh, regional leaders uh, for open education or the Arlo program. Uh, which I'm hoping will come back someday. <laughs> and um, I also am a fellow for the uh, Institute for Racially Just, Inclusive, and Open STEM Education, which uh, works at the intersections of open and STEM and uh, racial justice. So I'm delighted to be here and to talk more about uh, all things open and accessibility and access uh, in open. Karen, thank you so much. Seth? Uh, also very excited to be here. I am Seth Voletich. Uh, I am the scholarly communications librarian at the Colorado School of Mines. Um, how I ended up in this role is through accessibility work. Um, so I was working as a, an intern um, developing an open course to help faculty um, develop accessible resources. Really, my passion was accessibility, and I ended up in this role, um, and I facilitate the OER here at Minds, uh, where 
There are obviously unique accessibility challenges with uh, a lot of STEM resources. So I'm happy to be here uh, and talk about my experiences. Thank you so much, Seth. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I just wanna say how grateful I am to have you all here. You bring so much expertise to this topic. But before we get to our questions for you, let me just provide a little bit of context with some definitions. I think four kind of primary definitions. I'm not gonna read each of these slides entirely, but do note that OER generally are, are teaching and learning materials that you may freely use and reuse without charge. And they also allow you to remix the content through the affordances of their Creative Commons or GNU licenses that state specifically how the material may be used, reused, adapted, and shared. Open access is this kind of broader category of open. Open access refers to teaching and learning and research materials that are available free online for anyone to use as is. Accessibility means that individuals with disabilities can independently access the equivalent electronic and information technology experiences available to individuals without disabilities. And finally, another important concept for us today is universal design for learning, which is a teaching approach that works to accommodate the needs and abilities of all learners and eliminates unnecessary hurdles in the learning process. It's similar to universal instructional design and universal design for instruction. Note that all three advocate for accessible and inclusive instructional approaches that meet the needs and abilities of all learners. So with these definitions and context in mind, why don't we go ahead and get to our questions for our panelists. And Heather, I'm going to aim this first one right at you, if you don't mind, and then we can, you know, our fellow panelists can weigh in afterwards. But how do open education and accessibility increase accessibility for everyone? Uh, accessibility is, is really essential in developing OER. It amplifies the reach and the impact of OER by ensuring usability to a broader audience. Um, it ensures that everyone, regardless of their abilities, can fully participate in and benefit from course materials to perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the content effectively. Um, so it's an environment where, where everyone can succeed. Um, accessibility not only benefits students with disabilities, but also enhances the learning experience for all students. So for example, uh, providing transcripts for multimedia content for hearing impaired individuals, it can aid in um, comprehension for all learners, including those where the language used may not be their first language or for neurodivergent individuals. Um, an everyday example is how curb cutouts are not only used by people using wheelchairs and other mobility aids, um, but also benefit those people pushing strollers or riding bikes. So I really see open education and accessibility reinforcing each other by breaking down barriers and promoting inclusivity. So when uh, education becomes more open and accessible, it creates a ripple effect that benefits everyone. Heather, thank you so much. So well said. I mean, that's a great metaphor, the ripple effect. And, and, and I appreciate the emphasis on the fact that everyone can benefit from these practices. Seth and, and Karen, um, anything you'd like to add? Seth, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so I think the sort of purpose of open education is to allow as broad an audience as possible to access the resources that are necessary for education. Um, I think that, that accessibility is obviously a key component in that, um, in that space. It's not always the first thing people think about. I think, you know, some of that goes towards other benefits of, of open education, but really accessibility is sort of a cornerstone of, of this movement, um, accessibility and access to these resources. So um, in the absence of, of having accessible resources made through open education programs, uh, 
I don't know that the movement succeeds. So it is critical and core to the, the movement. Thank you, Seth. Karen? Um, I was just going to add that when we think about the need for accessibility in all of our learning materials, whether they're commercial learning materials, whether they're open learning materials, and we sort of think about, well, what is what does OER bring to the equation, right? Like this need for the kinds of accessible features that we have. And, and we don't want to forget those five R's, right? The fact that you can reuse, remix, redistribute materials. And so uh, OER actually lends itself to um, a greater variety of accessible features that we may be able to build into our learning materials and a, a, a greater amount of customization for professors, for classes, and a quicker turnaround time. So I just wanna highlight the fact that of course we need accessibility in every kind of learning material that we have, but there are particular advantages that, uh, that OER offers because of its, um, the ways in which the open license allows for all of those permissions. Karen, it's a great point. I mean, those open licenses can allow a faculty member on the fly, on demand, meet the needs of specific learners that they may have in their local community, right? Absolutely. And it's not always easy, right? Like faculty members have a lot on their plate. So to ask them to do this on top of that, this is why we're going to talk about um, broader communities for support as well. Oh, that's going to, that's a nice transition into the next question. Before we do, um, we have, as we go, we have some resources that we would like to share with attendees related to each of these questions and these conversations. So our WCET colleagues are going to put some links to these in the chat. We do have a um, copy of UDL guidelines from the organization CAST that might help assist those of you who are engaging in accessibility initiatives. We've got, as Kim has put in the chat, the open, Open Oregon DEI Toolkit, a really, really great uh, kind of very pragmatic resource for you. And then, uh, yeah, and, and, and chapter three of that focuses on accessibility. And, and it also talks about, as Karen had pointed out, the intersections between open education and accessibility. I mean, open education, those, afford, those licenses, the affordances of the licenses aren't doing us any good. They're not serving their purpose if we're not ensuring that all of those resources are also accessible to all. Okay, great. Well, Karen, then let me segue into asking you a question just about, so what, what is out there in terms of communities of support, in terms of maybe other toolkits and websites that can help those who are trying to ensure that their open educational resources are accessible? So um, because the open education community has been thinking about this for a number of years, right? There are a lot of people in, in the community and I really appreciated the comment. I think it was Megan that said when we were getting on before this webcast started that she sees a real connection and camaraderie and a closeness amongst the open education community that you don't necessarily see everywhere else. And I, I just wanna amplify that because I think it is true. And so having um, open educators that are truly and have truly been about centering students and really wanting them to succeed, I've been thinking about this and doing this for a number of years. There have been some wonderful resources that have been created by others that have asked questions about like, what do we think about when we say things like universal design for learning, for example. And um, the, the toolkit from the uh, University of British Columbia, which I'm hoping our, our link fairy, <laughs> someone's gonna drop in there, that accessibility toolkit, if you, if you don't get any other link today, like save that one, because really that is an incredible resource. There's a checklist for how to make your materials more accessible. And again, if you're thinking that it's a huge hurdle, you don't have to do all of it all at the same time. You can pick a few things, and think about what works for you. Um, I it's love my go-to resource, by the way, Karen. Yeah, thank Great. you for highlighting that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just wanted to say one of the things that they talk about when they define universal design, um, because they have key concepts in there, is they say, you know, it's the process of creating products that are usable by people with the widest possible range of abilities operating within the widest possible range of situations, right? So when we really think about being barrier free, being accessible, when we think about all of the folks that are involved, kind of the way Heather was talking about with the, the curve cut out, like that serves everyone. And so that we can, you know, think, use that kind of principle as we're designing our resources. So well said, Karen, thank you. 
Heather, Seth, any additional thoughts? Uh, well, as a former librarian, um, um, once a librarian, always a librarian, um, I, I want to say that librarians and instructional designers are, are really key resources, um, but for some community colleges that don't have um, these resources or maybe not enough of these resources uh, to turn to, communities like uh, the Community College Consortium for OER or CCC OER, uh, they have a wonderful listserv. It's a great place to reach out and ask for guidance or assistance in finding resources and, and to make connections with colleagues involved in the same work. Well said. Thank you, Heather. Seth? Yeah, uh, I was just going to add that the licensing of OER, the, the ability to adapt and reshare that um, makes it very ripe for for collaboration folks can they, they don't need to bite off the entire accessibility of a resource um, from the start they can put it out there as best as they can and it can be adapted and changed um, and then reshared and be made better it's it's an iterative process i don't think you know any of these resources become particularly uh, as good as they can be um, without without the collaborative um, the collaborative piece of this. So uh, I think a lot of people get caught up on like I need to make this thing perfect and share it, but there's there's a lot of opportunity to improve it um, and constantly improve it as time goes on. So um, I don't think accessibility should be a, a hurdle. It should instead be something that that can be worked towards collaboratively. Seth, that is so well said. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. Ensuring accessibility can be a heavy lift, especially for time-strapped faculty members, staff, librarians, for whoever might be involved in the process of ensuring accessibility for students of these resources. But thankfully, the open community has provided a lot of resources in order to support that. By the way, I see a lot of great questions coming into the Q&A, so thank you attendees. Something that you could do while we're kind of um, uh, having a discussion here among the panelists right now is, uh, uh, is upvote any of the questions that you would like to have rise to the top when we get to the Q&A around a half hour. So we are going to have time, hopefully, um, plenty of time to answer as many questions as possible. But uh, for now, you can certainly put those questions into the Q&A and then feel free to upvote uh, any that you might want to see us address first. So Seth, uh, I'm going to direct this next question to you. Could you talk a little bit about student perspectives? Of course, students must be the center of all this work. This is why we do what we do, right? So what are, you know, what are some advantages of open educational resources, you know, accessibility, the intersection of the two? Just give us a little bit of that student perspective, if you could. Sure. Um, so I met with some students actually just Monday. Uh, they, they were putting out a survey um, interested in trying to gather support to submit something to uh, the, the university faculty um, requesting lower cost resources. So first thing on students' minds, I think, is saving money. Um, obviously, like within that is the need to get the information that is required for them to succeed in a class. So having that on, on the first day is fantastic. That happens with OER, right? They get to save these resources. So that is better than a library subscription resource, which can save similar amounts of money, but the students don't get to retain access to it. Um, <clears throat> so all of these things help contribute to that. That said, um, I think, you know, there are instances where someone has, you know, tried an OER and maybe that isn't meeting the needs of a course. First and foremost, the students' needs need to be met, like they need to, to learn things. So if an OER isn't fitting those needs, either adjust it and uh, adapt something else um, or um, potentially move back to the resources that we're working because 
students are paying an awful lot. Like if we're, we're just thinking about cost savings, students are paying an awful lot just to be at school. Um, at least here in the United States, that's the case. Um, and, and so the resources first and foremost need to meet their needs. Um, so accessibility then becomes a concern in this space as well, right? Like if the students' needs aren't being met, if they aren't having the, their needs met through the accessibility of a resource, that needs to be adjusted um, and accounted for. Uh, so um, it's a consideration throughout the whole process. Like accessibility is built into this access of resources that is so core to OER that if the students aren't having their needs met, then um, the OER is, is potentially failing at what, what it's setting out to do. Seth, I so appreciate your emphasis always on meeting the needs of the student. That's what we need to do. And it 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 really is kind of the crux of the matter here. Heather, Karen, what, what could you what would you want to add? Heather, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I would also add that uh, it's also uh, affordability, I feel like with the students that I've worked with is definitely number one, but uh, it's all it also goes beyond affordability. Uh, can the students see themselves in the materials? And so, you know, uh, I think that's, whether it's through imagery, whether it's through content, I think that's a really important aspect of accessibility that, um, you know, it's something that that we, we need to spend more time talking about. Um, we don't want to ignore or skim over tough topics in conversations. Um, about you know the way the things that are happening in our society today and the you know students want to be engaged and and by talking about those tough topics you're going to engage them and and make them um, more active in in the the learning process i love that perspective heather and and the open licenses of of oer can help support that that's a benefit of them and of course accessibility will ensure that all learners can engage in what might sometimes be difficult subject matter or conversations that's so important in today's very complicated world right <laughs> karen yeah i think when we think about like what does it mean to meet students needs right there's a broad range of needs that we're trying to address and i think broad range of students right right yeah yeah exactly and i think heather kind of um touched on this when she was talking about the need for students to see themselves recognized in the materials, like looking at materials that say, yes, I see myself as a trans person there. I see myself as a person of color there. I see myself. And so Sarah Lambert wrote a, a while back an article about thinking about three levels of of justice that relate to open education, like the idea of redistributive justice. Yeah, they're, the materials are free and it helps to redistribute resources so that students can afford the materials, they have access, they can go to college. Uh, but the recognitive justice is that is that idea that you see yourselves and you see your students represented in those materials. And then she took it a step further to talk about representational justice. And this is where I was going to talk about, you know, it's not just uh, us revising materials so that students have different kinds of learning materials at their available to them or more accessible to them. But how do we actually engage students in the processes of that revision itself, right? That's the realm of open pedagogy. And so representational justice comes in the frame of can students' own voice be represented in these materials? Can the stances that they take the epistemologies that they um, afford themselves to, can that be put into these materials because the students in our classrooms are actually helping to create these materials and also thinking about those accessibility features as they're creating OER as well. And, I so, think that's and, Karen, and, and, and you know, it's also important, isn't it, that we do what we can to ensure that those who are developing, adapting, uh, sharing these open educational resources are as diverse as possible as well in every possible way. So we really need to ensure that in an intentional way, we're providing support for diverse faculty, uh, researchers, others, whoever are developing these to be able to, to engage in that kind of work. And that includes contingent faculty who often are, you know, might be quite diverse at an institution. And if you're not finding ways to support contingent 
also known as adjunct faculty in engaging in this work. And I think that you're not, you're really not doing your due diligence, I think. I tell you what, let's, um, let's do one more question as kind of an open question to, to our panelists, and then we'll start diving into the great questions that are coming in from attendees. I'm kind of excited to get into some of those. Let's kind of finish this panel section up by uh, talking about some hows. You, you already have actually been giving some great resources and, and even strategies, but are, is there more we could say about just how do we do this work? What are some strategies uh, for engaging in this type of work? Who'd like to go first? I can, I can jump in if the other panelists want me to. I, I think the how-to is always the hard question, right? Like, uh, again, the, the UBC resource has a list, has a checklist of how technically to do some things. But I think the bigger question is like, and I think there was a question in the Q&A, like, how do I get faculty to be motivated to do this? Like, how do I get this to rise up to as a top of priority on my campus? And, and those can be harder questions. And so I often talk about like that need for community, like you need a community of people on your campus that are willing to be that team, like find one faculty champion and a library dean and, you know, maybe someone else on the campus that are say, we're going to pull together a small task force, we're going to get a little bit of a grant, we're going to connect with the CCC OER's learning community, we're going to pull together a plan, we're going to take this to our president and it's going to become a priority for our institution. And if that's too big of a lift, just doing it like within your department, maybe it's your biology department and, and motivating folks and working with others. And if you don't have anybody in your own institution, you can definitely connect with people online and have your community be a virtual community of support to work on these things together. So that's just a, a very brief beginning <laughs> to answer that question, which has a much deeper. I know because it's not an easy question. And thanks for addressing, Karen. I'm glad you did because the 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 question that has risen to the top here is that that one about how, how you motivate faculty, uh, et cetera. So anyway, Heather, that you and Seth also want to address that, I'd appreciate that uh, since that is a uh, obviously a hot topic for attendees. I think uh I think you know uh piggybacking on what what Karen was saying it's it's um it's it's a lot it's 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 a lot to take on it's a big ask for faculty and so how to motivate them is is to remind them that they can start small just like if they're if they were just developing OER um, uh, from the very first stages, it's to start small and, and there is always that opportunity to improve later on. Of course, we would love it if um, every project followed UDL guidelines and we um, you know, followed a, a process so that we made sure that everything was accessible in every possible way. But it doesn't always happen like that. It's not, it's not always, it's not always possible. Um, so, uh, building that building that group of support around you um and uh just in my in my experiences i've i've always uh, it seems found uh building my own support group online like karen was saying um something that has really really helped guide me in in my in my progress and uh just finding people out there in the oer community to touch base with and get get support from has been has been a highlight but maybe, yeah, start small. Great advice, Heather. And again, it's such a generous community. There are so many folks who are willing to help because they know that then you'll be able to return the favor at some point, most likely. Seth, any thoughts on this? Sure. Um, so, you know, similar to Heather and Karen, um, I find community is sort of essential in this, this regard. Um, I'd like to add that, like, I... I built that accessibility course, and I've found that that's pretty successful, like enroll folks in that who are interested in developing an OER. So they have the tools from the start as they're developing that OER to know how to, to make things accessible. Because I think a lot of it's just, it's like a mystery to folks, like how do I make this accessible? How, how can I possibly make, you know, a visual resource, something that, that folks with visual impairments can read, or an auditory resource, something that's accessible to other folks. They, they just don't understand these things. So demystifying that at the beginning and letting them know, here are the tools that are at our at your disposal. Um, 
and the stuff that we subscribe to as an institution to help curate such such resources um and then they can go from there and, and build their resource hopefully with with accessibility in mind because it's it's challenging to come back through as well and and try and remediate um after the fact you know oftentimes you don't you don't realize a student uh needs some sort of accommodation until maybe weeks before a class is starting and what do you do then um can, can I also jump in a little bit more to talk about faculty motivation? It's something I've been thinking about for years, even like as a faculty member, what motivated me, what didn't motivate me. And I think that um, a, a lot of it just kind of comes back to the fact that at the heart, like faculty really want their students to succeed. You know, like we can complain about them. Like they they come late, they don't do the assignment, they're not engaged. Like I think sometimes these fa these complaints that we can have about our students are, are mirrors for ourselves to say, well, what what am I doing? How am I not engaging my students? You know, and the, these the, these kinds of questions can be really helpful. And I, there there's a piece I'm gonna I, I was looking this up and I'm gonna drop this link in the chat that was it was written in 2019. Um, so it was before the pandemic, right? Um, uh, and it was written by Kate Denial, who, who talked about a pedagogy of kindness. Like, what does it mean to adopt the pedagogy of kindness when, you, when your students come into the classroom? You know, one of the most powerful things you can do is, is just say, how are you? Right, just asking your students where they are, how they are, what, what they're feeling, and, and taking that sort of human approach. And I think this links to our conversation about accessibility, because it's like, thinking about who our students are, what their needs are, who actually are they as people? How can we be kind to them? Th this can translate into all kinds of things when we talk about how we structure the course, when we allow our students to have more control over course content and course policies and, and even grading. I know we're not gonna go there today, but I feel like there's a lot that can be said when we think about what does it mean um, to design for care and think about pedagogy of care. And when you bring that to your faculty, they're like, huh, I want to know more about that. I want to be involved in a faculty learning community that's talking about kindness and care for students, not tools and technology and techniques and licenses. Like that, that is the place that can um, really get faculty motivated and get them into the kinds of learning communities that can be really powerful. Karen, I think you know that I, I'm a former faculty member myself. And I remember a colleague at one point saying something to the effect of, my job would be so much easier if it weren't for the students. <laughs> and, and I think I said, you wouldn't have a job if it weren't for the students. None of us would. So let, let's have a little kindness and a little care and you know, hope that the students return that to us because we as faculty, staff, administrators need that as well. And creating this community of caring, it, it is such a great, such a great point. I also want to point out, you know, one of the things I love about doing these are the resources that our attendees share with us. And uh, Kim in the chat has uh, shared Lisa Young at Maricopa Community College in Arizona. Her, her and her amazing team there have created a, an updated version of professional development competencies. And they just released those today. Hi, Kim. Shout out to you. Kim and I work together in California. I serve as a project manager for the technical assistance program of the ZTC grants that are happening in California. I have the privilege of doing that work. And Kim and I work together on that. So thanks for sharing that, Kim. Debbie Baker, who is at Maricopa, is, has also shared a resource here for us. And I'm noting that we have a question in here from, Shush, from Sushma. So let me see if I can get to that in a little bit, if I can get back to, oh, oh, Megan asked Sushma to edit the Q&A. So we're gonna come to that in a minute. But I, you know, I just really love the sharing of different resources within the chat. So let me go ahead and turn to some of the other questions because you did a nice job of addressing, I think, one of the top questions here in the Q&A. And oh boy, somebody somebody brought up policy, which I think is uh, just, you know, it's such a necessary thing to talk about because so much of what we do must be grounded in policy. So can, can you speak to the policies related to digital accessibility and OER that help to support these efforts and initiatives? Uh, I can I can speak to uh, uh, the project that I was working with Open Oregon on. Um, it's it's 
it's really, I find it really tough to, um, to have, have a policy in place, even though I, I know that it's, it's, it's a necessary, um, but in, in, in some situations, it's, it's really it's really difficult to say okay this this is the policy and we have to we have to follow this um, in order to to get the product that we promised um, to our students and our faculty. Um, so um, I'm hoping I'm hoping someone else has has more experience more experience with with policy the policy side of things because it's um, I feel like it's sometimes it's it's one of the only ways to get things done just because they, you know, faculty are, are dealing with so many day-to-day -day, um, tasks and responsibilities that it can, it can, like we mentioned before, it can be that, that, that heavy ask. Does anyone else have any um, other experiences, uh, you know, that they want to talk about regarding policy? Um, I'll say that, that, the, the course that I created uh, or co-created, um, it was developed because the law that allowed us to start developing OER here at Mines, um, they passed a law that provided grant funding. And with that was accessibility uh, written into it, which makes a lot of sense. But at the same time, it's a lot easier said than done. So like our means of complying was just providing the tools because sort of going in and trying to monitor exactly what was going on um, at a, a micro level was not really possible. Um, instructors are going to do what they're going to do. Uh, ideally, they would make things accessible. Um, that's not always the case, though. Um, so. I think institutional policies could help. Um, certainly if there's there's a lot of motivation at institutions and their leadership is is well inclined to make sure that everything is accessible for everyone, that can definitely add to it. But um, I know that that here, you know, we're a small institution, we do not have a lot of resources in, in this space. Um, so if we are to mandate accessibility, without providing resources to, to faculty to make that a reality, it becomes a challenge. And they're not likely to comply, not because they don't want to. Um, I think, you know, folks who are interested in creating OER are some of the most interested in educating their students and providing equitable access. They just don't have the tools at their disposal or the means to make this a reality. So um, institutional policy coming with the financial or other support that's necessary to make it a reality, I think is critical. It can't just be a policy. A policy is meaningless without action. I think also, um, and folks, I'm really appreciative are putting uh, things in the chat about different policies. I know Russ Poulin put something about federal policy, there can be state policy, institutional policies. And when we think about the different kinds of things that again, motivate people to do the things they need to do, right? Like within any movement, you kind of have those folks that I need a policy that says I have to do this, so I guess I better do it, you know? And then you have um, students that are screaming for, uh, we want this to happen. And so that's part of the movement because we need this to be the case. And then you have your faculty champions that are kind of from the ground up saying, this is what we want to do. This is not just, we're not just doing this because a policy is making us do this. It's because we know it's the right thing to do for our students. And, and I feel like when you have that sort of sandwiched approach of using policy, faculty motivation, student action, you know, coming together, uh, the, the accessibility, you know, communities of people that are differently abled, that are working at legislative levels for policies to happen, like all of that happens in concert to um, address a, you know, a huge uh, issue, which is to try to make all of our OER and all of our learning materials accessible, which is, which is a really tall order. Um, so I think there are, there are definitely policies out there and I'm glad people are posting them um, and that they're one piece of the puzzle. They're, they're not the silver bullet, right? They're, they're part of a larger puzzle. 
Thanks, Karen. And I appreciate you emphasizing that kind of multi-pronged approach, be it from all the way up at the federal level down to the student level. And I just want to emphasize that, and I don't mean that students are at the bottom. Students should be at the center, right? And we should be involving students in policy development related to open education, related to accessibility at any point that we can. If nothing else, have them review the policies, ensure that they are meeting the needs, back to what Seth kept emphasizing rightfully of the students. I see Melissa in the chat said that, Seth, however, you know, there's a caveat here, right? Seth is spot on with the reality of what many institutions face. It makes me think of the course marking legislation in Texas that was passed back in 2018, requiring institutions to mark their uh, courses that use open educational resources, easier said than done. And I will go ahead and say on record that, that, that I think many would agree with me in Texas, this, the state did not uh, really allocate resources that might be ne needed at any given institution to implement. It's complicated. There's a lot of back-end things that have to happen and that take time in order to do that. But once you do, you know, ensuring that students know where, know what classes are using OER, know how to, how to access them, it can be a very, very powerful tool, I think. I want to emphasize what um, Jennifer Owens wrote in the chat, and I tried to do a chat thumbs up there, which is accessibility is a we issue, not an issue where others should hold the responsibility. Like, oh, that's for the accessibility team to do, you know, or that's that office. And faculty can often kind of cop that attitude. Oh, well, that's not what I do. I have to teach biology. You go do the accessibility thing. And that that is really not a helpful or good strategy for accessibility or any other kinds of strategies that help students do better in classroom spaces. And so, um, Again, you know, just emphasizing that idea that we all have to be in this together at all different levels. Uh, thank you for emphasizing that, Karen, the, the, the point that Jennifer had, had made. Of course, we are grateful. I, I think everyone would say we're grateful for the expertise that an accessibility or a disability office or services brings to, to the work we do, but we all have to own it, don't we? Heather, Seth, let me make sure I give you an opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, to raise any issues you wanted to related to this, and if then I'll move on to another. The question here. Okay. Well, let's see. Um, I, uh, I let me let me raise this. Even it what didn't, didn't come to the top of the of the the questions here, but I, I'm I'm really intrigued to hear what your what your responses might be for an OER that was initially accessible. How do we encourage faculty who reuse, adapt, and revise it later? to maintain, or I would argue improve, sorry, Russ, put that question in, on um, that same level of accessibility. Thoughts? I don't wanna be taking my greater than my share of answers to this. So if Heather or Seth wanna go first, go ahead, but I have some thoughts on it. <laughs> um, it's a great question. Um, because it, it, it has a lot to do with what is the spirit of reuse and, and remixing. You know, there's a share alike license that says if you use this material, you should license it under the same license that I did. So you're kind of sharing it alike. Um, and there's no license that says if I made this accessible, you have to make it accessible too. So there, there are no like safeguards to make that happen. But I think the more that we can encourage each other to do that, if you create an OER in, in a press books format, for example, it, it could be in a preamble. Say, my hope is that if you take, you know, as the author, and you attribute me and use my material. My hope is that you'll make it equally accessible when you use it. And it's, you know, it's a hope. It's not a, it's not a mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Karen. Seth, I think you, you had gone off sure. mine. So. Yeah, I think along those lines, like it's just awareness, right? Like faculty may not even be aware that a resource was made with special care to be accessible. So noting that and making them aware that that, that is what has gone on and the thoughts that have gone on into that, um, that, that can help folks uh, understand the importance of this going forward, adopting it, adapting it. Um, and then I think like they, they just need to also be aware of the tools that are out there, the, the methodologies that are used to make things accessible because, you know, a lot of this is happening on the back end, right? Like in press books, they don't see the, the uh, alternative text for images 
that doesn't mean that it's not there. It's just like they're they're unaware of it because they're living within their own experiences. Well said, Seth. Heather? Yeah, just to add to what Seth was saying, um, I mean, you could go so far as to add a statement to your press book to say, you know, a lot of care and time went into doing, you know, X, Y, Z and listing out those, those things. And we hope that if you um, you know, adapt this resource that you will continue that. Um, I think that maybe sometimes being direct is is the best way to approach things. And um, yeah, that could certainly, it would certainly get people's attention. Heather, it's like you read my mind. At the risk of being self-serving, I'm dropping a link in the chat to my openly licensed resource on climate change and narrative film that I developed this past year. And I have included an accessibility statement and that link goes right to it. I'm finding this to be a more common practice and I think it is a great one. And I have to give a nod to the accessibility toolkit that we've already been referencing because that's, I used that, I adapted that in order to create that accessibility statement. And at, at the, at, within that accessibility statement, I also invite readers of the resource to contact me if they find any aspect of the resource that is not accessible to them specifically so that I can mitigate and remediate that and ensure that it is as accessible as possible. The statement is not perfect, but I so agree with you, Heather, that this is an important practice, I think, that hopefully we will all be engaging in as we can. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Appreciate that. And it's great to share things like this because, you know, it's OER, copy it, use it, take it, you know, that like take you to statement and think about it as a guiding post for your own work. That's and the whole and the whole resource is openly licensed. So take that and make it better, um, please. And, and let me know if possible. <laughs> and this this also actually makes me think about um, images that are in the public domain um, on, on different uh, diverse and inclusive image repositories. They'll, they put the images out in the public domain and say, you know, use these, use these at your will. Um, we want them to be out there. But if, if you, like I've made it a practice to um, give credit, um, even when uh, it's in the public domain or um, people don't ask for credit, because my hope is that people will go back to those those resources and um, you know those resources will be motivated to create more uh, great content and, and imagery to to share out there. So um, just taking it that extra step, like even if you don't even if you don't have to share and give credit, do that anyways. It just reminded me about that, that connection. That's wonderful, Heather, thank you. And you know, speaking of your organization, CCC OER, I'm so pleased to see Wade Oshiro here, who is a colleague of mine on the executive council of CCC OER. And he stated that he's capturing some of the resources today and pointed out that CCC OER has an EDI committee that re recently initiated an EDI resource curation project and that they are working on that, that resources in progress and they'll be sharing updates with the project, with the open community, of the project with the open community soon. So wonderful. Oh, I, and I, let's see, we, Seth mentioned an accessibility course. Could you please expand? And is my open math considered accessible? Um, sure, I can expand on the accessibility course. So it's, uh, published in Canvas Commons. Um, we adapted that from the California Community Colleges. Uh, they created an, an um, accessibility course. So this is a self-paced course. We adapted it, uh, you know, like I've mentioned, the, the institutional needs here are a little different, um, very STEM heavy. So things like equations and uh, visual representations were, were sort of our focus was trying to create this resource or adapt this resource in some ways um, to fit those needs a little bit better. Um, I truthfully, it's been through several like revisions now at this point. I don't know how much of the original content is in there. I think there's still some, but um, it's, um, it's an open course on Canvas Commons. I can share a link with you here. Just give me a moment to search for that. Um, and as far as um, math, uh, my open math, I am 
not familiar enough to say, but I, I can hop on in there and give it a look for sure. Thanks, Seth. And, and, and while you do that, I think we might have time for one or two more questions from our attendees. And let me, uh, Rachel Becker, she wasn't anonymous, she asked this question. And I think we've talked a lot about kind of communities that you can join and reach out to related to open education in general. But I think this is a little more specific to both to the intersection of OER and accessibility. Are there any learning circles or connection points that collaborate to make OER accessible. I feel passionate about accessibility, but as we've kind of alluded to or, or been rather explicit about, am overwhelmed trying to put it into practice. Any ideas about that? Maybe Heather or Seth are aware of some. I'm not aware of any in particular, but it doesn't mean that they're not out there. And I feel like, um, there are ways to try to gather people to create the learning circles. I always say, if you can't find something, create it yourself. And uh, I'm going to put the link to uh, OE Global's Connect platform out there too, because I was just searching through OEG Connect and I typed in the word accessibility and there, there's no one sort of single learning community out there, although people have talked about it. Um, so it would be a great thing for someone to start. And, you know, maybe Heather will get somebody in the CCC OER to start an accessibility learning circle. Um, and uh, often the community college consortium does include people that are not necessarily at community colleges as well. So you don't have to feel like, oh, I can't go to that because I'm not in a community college. Um, but creating an online platform, um, maybe that's something that Wade will uh, eventually include into his curated list of resources as some links to some circles. But um, maybe a number, any of the participants that here that know of them, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Thank you, Karen. Heather, thoughts? Yeah, so thank you for uh, promoting OEG Connect and um, the community college listserv. Like you said, it's, it's uh, we have um, individuals in there, you know, from beyond community colleges. So it's, it's really um, a diverse group of people that, that contribute to that. Um, I would also say that uh, the, I'm putting this link in the, in the chat, the International Association of Accessibility Professionals, um, if anyone has gone through their courses, uh, they, they have a listserv that you can join um, with very, very focused on accessibility. But I, I love the idea, Karen, to, to uh, work with OE Global and CCC OER to try to um, have something focused towards accessibility. Seth, did, I wanted to come back to you quickly, um, circle circle back on that question about MyOpen. Did you have any anything you wanted to add to that? I don't. I'm looking at it right now, and I I, I haven't uh, spent enough time here to, to really make any sort of preliminary judgment on how accessible it is. I know that it's difficult to make math accessible. I know that that's a, a perennial challenge for instructors. Um, I've even chatted with like some folks in their math department about it, and I know that they want to make things accessible, but for whatever reason, math is kind of almost like last in line for things. So as they're developing texts or writing things in, in uh, LaTeX, LaTeX doesn't really have any accessible, um, accessible uh, math equation extensions. So um, it creates a PDF that's unreadable by folks with visual disabilities. Um, that said, there are tools. I know that we use one here at Minds um, called Equatio that lets folks grab like a, a little window, like a screen grab of an equation, um, and then it will uh, read that out loud. It'll even convert it into accessible formats. Um, so it's pretty handy, but uh, as far as I can tell, I I don't know, at least not like looking at the surface of it, if my open math is, a, is an accessible resource. Thanks, uh, no, no problem. And we do have someone who put um, the accessibility statement for my open math into the chat. Uh, so hopefully that'll be a helpful resource. Heather, um, you want yeah, to? Yeah, just, just to add to what Seth was saying, um, it's difficult, but it is possible. Uh, I have a colleague at Virginia Tech, a former colleague that um, I'm going to drop, uh, I'm going to find the website and drop it in the, in the chat. but. Um, because LaTeX is not accessible, they they kind of went a different route and um, 
put put the uh, the content in press books and then went from there. But um, I'm sure it was it's it's a much more complex than I'm making it seem. So I'm going to share a link about that. Thank you, Heather. And I tell you what, we are just about out of time for the panelists, and I'm going to want to turn it back over to our uh, WCET colleagues. Apologies, we weren't able to get to great questions about KPIs related to accessibility to OER, about VPATs, and about the accessibility of OER Commons uh, content, which I, I, I do believe that they, they do ensure that the content is accessible, but don't quote me on that. Uh, but uh, let me just say thank you so much to our panelists and how what an honor it is to be able to moderate uh, this, in, this discussion with you, given the expertise that you bring to the field, and to thank the attendees for their contribution. But Megan, let me turn it back over to you to finish up our podcast. Thank you so much, Judith, and thank you to Heather, Karen, and Seth. This was a great conversation, and clearly there's probably need for more webinars like this in partnership with NW Heat. so thank you. I'm just going to run through a few slides here. So we did record this and we'll compile all of those wonderful resources that were shared. And WCET members will also receive access to our OER uh, Closer Look guide that Judith authored. So we'll be sharing that with members uh, via the webcast link and then also in our Friday news. And if this is your first webinar with WCET, jump on our website and learn more about us. We're guided by community equity policy and practice. And uh, we're also doing, I don't think we have a slide in here, but if you are not a member of WCET and you're interested in joining, contact me and I can talk to you about the benefits. We also have a 35% off of membership discount available through the end of the year. And I wanna acknowledge NW Heat again. Thank you so much for your partnership and collaboration. And for WCET members, and if you're not a member, all the more reason to join. We have a virtual summit coming up on February 22nd on the practice and policy of AI in education. Lastly, I want to thank our WCET annual sponsors and our supporting members that help make much of our events, programs, and activities here at WCET possible. So again, thank you to everybody. We really appreciate your engagement in the conversation, and we'll see you on a future event. Have a great afternoon. Bye all.